today I want to tell you about my journey and focus specifically on one side, which is science fiction. Um, so I'm a science communicator. I communicate science on social media and I have been doing this since 2009 when I was still at the university doing my bachelor's degree. Um, and so I started my journey in 2009, and whenever there were exams, of course, I would shut down the Facebook and just focus on my exams. But every time, it's just bring it back, continue, and it picked up in 2015. So 2015, social media platforms, especially Facebook, started to focus more on video content. And I decided to focus on video content, posting more content in the video format, when I started, I was mostly sharing them as links, then as infographics, and then progressed into video content, which then contributed to the growth. Now I have um, almost 70, uh, 37 million followers on social media, more than 21 billion views, and every week I reach uh, more than 300 million users across different social media platforms. And so my mission and my goal is basically to take complex science, simplify it, and then communicate it to the general public. Scientists are very busy doing their work, so they need someone to communicate these results to the general public, and that's where I come in. And science is amazing. The reason I do this is because it influences our life every day. If we are not connected to science, which contributes to our life, creating amazing technology, which affects our life, then we're not gonna be making rational decisions. That's why I want everybody to learn about what's happening in the world of science and inspire them to make decisions based on that. And so I kept doing this for a while, and then I thought, you know what? There's always a need for innovation. There's always a need to come up with new media new way to communicate science, new exciting frontiers. And I thought, you know what, why don't I just not switch completely to science fiction, but create a second layer of communication through science fiction. And instead of completely abandoning science, which is bound by reality, inspire people also through science fiction. And there's a lot of people who love science fiction. How many people love science fiction here? Please raise your hands. Well, that's a good number. Amazing. Carl Sagan, how many of you know Carl Sagan? Great. So Carl Sagan is an astronomer, astrophysicist, and he is a science communicator. He was a science communicator. He created a TV show called Cosmos, which is very famous. And when I watched it for the first time, many years actually, many years later after he passed away, I was inspired to even go deeper into the science communication. His TV show inspired millions of people to become scientists and engineers. He has an amazing way of communicating science. And one thing that he did through uh, his journey was also try to go into science fiction. And so he learned about this theory about the wormholes from Stephen Hawking. And he said, why don't I write a novel around wormholes, you know? where aliens are sending Earth a signal and we have to decode it and make contact with them. And he called it Contact. And this novel was very successful. It was turned into a film, which also was very successful. And so Carl Sagan saw science fiction as a way to inspire people to learn more about science. Because if you read about a character in a story who's trying to communicate with aliens and the novel is inspiring you to see how they are doing it and it's using scientific concepts, you become inspired to learn about these things. And so I thought, you know what? I love what Carl Sagan did. I love what he worked on and I'd like to do something similar. Now, science fiction is very important. If you look at all the innovations we have in our lives, at some point they were either part of uh, a movie, a novel, they were just an imagination, part of a documentary that probably came in 1940s, 1960s. If you look at these documentaries, there was more imagination about the future back in the day. And I feel like that imagination went down 
as we progress, probably because there is a balance between science and science fiction. The things that we have imagined are now becoming a reality. So what else is left to imagine, right? Actually, there's still a lot left to imagine. Uh, I think everybody's aware of ChatGPT at this point, right? Raise your hand if you are aware of ChatGPT. Raise your hand if you're using it. <laughs> well, that's actually the same number, more or less. Yeah. Uh, have you watched that film Space Odyssey 2001? Yeah, so in Space Odyssey 2001, there is this robot HAL, an AI system, okay? And this robot has a sense of awareness. When you look at ChatGPT, it's pretty much similar, actually. We're communicating with ChatGPT, which can generate this incredible data in such a short time. And now it's almost becoming you know, when you talk to it, it's almost like becoming self-aware entity. And recently they introduced to ChatGPT the voice feature. You know, you can talk to ChatGPT and have a conversation. If you have seen that film, Her, from 2013, where he falls in love, you know, with, with, with his phone, it's like Siri, we're already there. I was reading on Reddit a post where somebody was confessing, saying, you know what? I want to confess, I use ChatGPT. I uploaded all the conversations I was having with my mom and I told him to act as my mom because I never had a conversation with her before she died. And I felt like there was some closure. It's actually amazing how people use technology in different ways. Um, and all these ideas, at some point, they were just science fiction and now they are becoming a reality and we live in such an incredible time where we get to experience these technologies. And so why science fiction is important? I would say, first of all, it stimulates public interest in science. It improves our understanding of science. It makes us more interested in it, but at the same time, it triggers philosophical questions. Now, this is a concept that I created. It's called Ectolife. Ectolife is an artificial womb facility where you can grow your baby inside a growth pod and allow it to develop for nine months. And then you just go and get your baby from inside a pod. And so I created a 10 minute video and I posted it on social media and it went viral. And so people then started asking questions. Are we really that far? Now, when I created the concept, I made sure that everything within it is science-based, that it has been done. 50 years of scientific research that I explored when I was making this. And so this triggered public interest in science because now they're asking, are we really that far? Can you really grow an embryo outside a mother's uterus to that point? Can the field of ectogenesis, it's a scientific field where you can grow a baby outside the mother's uterus, has it advanced this to this level? People started reading, started discussing. And it's all because of this concept that I created. And then some others started exploring the ethical and philosophical questions. Is it ethical to do this? What will happen to the bond between the baby and the mother? Is there a bond? just like natural birth, or is it gonna be gone? And can we call her a mother if she's just contributing the genetic material? Philosophical questions, ethical questions. People started asking all of these questions. Uh, and uh, this is, this might look like science fiction, but I try to, you know, you don't want to get too much into science fiction in my line of uh, work, if I get too much into science fiction and I'm communicating science every day, people will perceive everything that I share as science fiction. And I don't want to fall into that. So that's why even the concepts that I'm creating, they're always based on actual science. And by the way, these two pictures were created by Mid Journey, artificial intelligence. Thank you so much. It's easy now to do this kind of stuff. So science fiction stimulates creativity. And it takes us to new fronts. It encourages hypothetical thinking. Is this possible? We always hypothesize. The first basic thing 
about anything related to science, whether it's an experiment or a search for a fact, is hypothesis. Is it possible to do this? And you can't create an, uh, any hypothesis if you don't imagine. As Einstein said, imagination is more important than knowledge. And so science fiction expands the scope of possibilities and most importantly, it allows us to merge fields, a multidisciplinary thinking. There are fields that you think might not go together like physics and biology, can they really blend? In the world of science fiction, they can blend. And once you blend them in the world of science fiction, you can blend them in real life as well. And so what I love about science fiction is that it encourages a multidisciplinary thinking. When I created the ectolife concept, by the way, the video is on YouTube, you can watch it there. When I created it, I merged many fields. You have stem cell research. You have ectogenesis, molecular biology, molecular uh, genetics, genetic engineering, all of these fields combined into a single field, artificial intelligence. And I mean, my degree is molecular biology and genetic engineering. And so this was my field and I have always tracked the latest development in this field and the other fields that, that are concerned with creating an, a baby inside an artificial environment and I decided to put them together and I was amazed by the response. Um, and so science fiction inspires us to solve problems and it creates a sense of wonder. Now, there are two types of uh, people when it comes to science fiction. There are people who want everything to be realistic to science. And there are those who will tell you, you know, just unleash your imagination, be creative, okay? Go wild. Now, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who also met Carl Sagan, he always criticizes films, yeah? It's like, why is the sunset, you know, like this? Why is this airplane designed like this? It looks like it doesn't have enough weight to go on this planet. And, and he says that for the film to earn the right to be criticized on a scientific level is a high compliment indeed. Now I wanna ask you a question. Should science fiction always be bound by reality? If you think so, please raise your hand. Do you think science fiction should always be realistic to science? Yeah, I think we all want it to go wild, right? Imagine, show us different worlds. That's why we love Star Wars, huh? There is no force, where's the force? But we love it because of the story, because of other technologies that are also related to science. And so I disagree with this. I think science fiction needs no boundaries because that's how you inspire creativity and that's how you inspire people to look into concepts that they haven't learned about for a while. Now, my journey with science fiction started around 2017. I was always communicating science and I love films, I love movies, but I don't know enough about how they are made. I had two options when I was in Berlin. One option is to join film school, but that costs thousands of dollars or make my own film, which cost even more thousands of dollars. <laughs> so I decided to go for the second one because learning by doing is the best form of learning. And so I wrote a script for a short film called Simulation. And Simulation explores the simulation hypothesis, which says that everything we know, everything we say, everything around us might just be part of a simulation controlled by another entity. And this talk was already part of a program and the next sentence is already written. It's part of a code, yeah? So that's, that's the hypothesis, a very wild hypothesis. I love it. And I decided to write a short film around the story. And after I wrote the short film and got feedback from my friends on the film, I decided to just hire a crew, bring in actors, yeah? I did the casting, I, 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 I bought some books on how to make a film, 
And at the same time, I was watching videos on YouTube from other filmmakers, how they did it. I love, you know, that you can now learn anything for free. It's all available on YouTube, yeah? And I brought in a crew, say, hey, have you ever made uh, a film before? Say, no, 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 I haven't. Say, then why are we bringing this high-end equipment? I mean, this is a sixty, seventy thousand dollar camera. Normally, when you start your first film, you, you know, you can use a DSLR camera, which is like two thousand or something. But you're going big. I say, you know what? I want to learn. You know, move a few steps ahead. And so, it was one of the most amazing experiences ever. Really, you know, bringing all the crew. We had some amazing uh, makeup. Yeah prosthetics and makeup artists and uh, actually the neighbors when I was filming in my house <laughs> were like, hey, you're using a lot of electricity. This is going in your bill. You brought all these lights. They saw all the lights outside. Was, they, they were about to call the police. <laughs> like, okay, worth it. Um, but I learned a lot and you know, the film, the short film uh, simulation came out in 2018. I organized a film premiere in, in, in Berlin and people, around 300 people came into the cinema and watched it and I was answering questions. It was such an incredible experience. Here are some shots from the film. You can just go and watch it on my YouTube channel. It's available there. And the film received multiple awards at international film festivals. I was like, okay, not bad for a first time filmmaker. It's a good start. But it had two problems. You know, sometimes when you revisit your old work, you see that, you know what, there are things that I could have done differently. There are things that I wish I had the knowledge at the time to do them better. And so the first problem with this uh, film is that it was too short. And the story in my head is just too big. It's much uh, a big universe and there are so many characters and so many things. But then I look at the budget. Creating science fiction costs a lot of money. Well, there is another way to do it. Write it, okay? I decided to write it as a science fiction novel. <laughs> That's it, yeah? I mean, can you imagine turning this into movies or series? That would cost a lot of money, yeah? But what I love about writing and creative writing is that you can just unleash your imagination and write whatever you want. You're not bound by the number of pages or anything. And I published this novel this year. I'm gonna show you uh, where you can download it for free as well, because it's, uh, it's available for free. And so it, it goes deeper than what the movie showed. And uh, yeah, this is the link. Just go download it from my website. Yeah, you can take, um, a picture if you want, and then you can go later and download it. Um, people always say, are you afraid of AI? Because ChatGPT can now write novels and stories. I say, no, I am not. I'll tell you why. We don't write stories because we want to just get done with it and finish and move on to the next day. No, because it's therapeutic. It's like therapy. There are things about the real world that you cannot control. But when you are writing, you have full control of everything. It's like you are the god of the story. If AI is going to take that away from me, fine. Let other writers do that kind of stuff. But I will keep writing. And I love science fiction. And um, this is just the first novel out of many to come. The second problem with the short film was, you know, I brought a crew of people who do visual effects. If you are trying to create compelling story, you need some visual effect. That's animations, 3D models, and all of that. Lucky for me, I was in Berlin. There is a company that does this kind of stuff. They, they're called Movie Brats, and they have worked on Star Trek. So I say, wow, that's, that's, that's like a dream team to work with. And so um, I was always going to them, to their office, and see them like a big team working on their computers, creating these animations, you know, just seeing your imagination come to life in moving pictures is just wild. And I would go to them, I think they got bored. 
hey, you are, you are the client who is visiting us, the mall, say, you know what, I want to learn the process from the inside. I want to see what are you using, what tools, because I want to do that myself later on. I paid them tens of thousands of dollars to create a short group of shots for the short film, not even a lot. And I said, if I really want to go deeper into this, I need to learn the process myself. So during COVID-19 lockdown, we all had a lot of time in our hands. I said, I want to learn visual effects. So I delved deeper and I learned that these are the tools that people use, starting you know, with these tools, Cinema 4D, Octane, After Effect, and I just wanted to start. It's like a full visual effects company inside one place, yeah? where I can do everything by myself. And I spent three months learning this, mainly from YouTube tutorials, sometimes buying one or two courses, or going to Skillshare, an annual membership, and you have exclusive access to the courses. And I was learning day by day. When I felt that I was comfortable on a level where I can finally put my skills into use, I decided to move from short films and create a full feature film, one hour and 30 minutes, all by myself, writing, directing, visual effects, editing, sound design, all of it, casting. And it's called Orbital. It's still in, uh, under production. I mean, it's a one man show, basically. And I published the trailer for Orbital. Here are some shots from Orbital, okay? So this was like a green screen, remove the green screen. And it's about this guy. It's a documentary style. It's about this guy. His name is Peter Randolph. And he is the richest man in the solar system. And how did he make his wealth? He made his wealth by mining asteroids. Did you know that a single asteroid, this is real, that a single asteroid can be worth 10 quintillion dollars. I forgot how many zeros in the 10 quintillion, so you have to do the 30. <laughs> 10 quintillion dollars worth of, I mean, if, if we bring one asteroid, we're gonna suffice the whole minerals and rare elements that we need on Earth. It's incredible. And so this guy goes to, into that in business but then they discover there's more resources than Earth needs. What are they gonna do with the rest of the asteroids? There are two million asteroids in our solar system. Think about that, two million asteroids. If we bring all of them, we're gonna have a lot of resources. So he decides to build the ring around Earth where people live inside actually. But because it's so massive, there are shadows which are making night and day cycle difficult for a lot of people, yeah? And so the film explores, this is, this is someone who was constructing the rings, and she is a historian who tells us what happened throughout the years when the rings were built and after that. Here are some more pictures from the rings, and it's all my work, yeah? After I learned visual effects. And I published the trailer on social media, and it got more than 70 million views and many articles written about it. And uh, I'm still working on this, and I'm really excited about it. This will be one of my biggest projects. Now, when it comes to working on a long project all by yourself, sometimes you get bored, burned out. I think we all experience that, right? How many of you experience burnout in their work? Please raise your hands. I think everybody, <laughs> right? So what do you do in this case? Personally, what I do, I take a short break by doing a shorter project, something else, yeah? And so I did two short projects in between while I'm working on my uh, orbital full film. The first one is called the Sky Cruise Nuclear Powered Hotel. Well, again, it sounds like science fiction, but it was also inspired by, so I'm gonna tell you what it is, but look at the size of this plane compared to the other ones. It's like a cruise with all the facilities of a cruise, you know, f film theaters, you know, uh, cinema, uh, you've got malls and everything, and it's all inside, and it's powered by nuclear energy. 
yeah? And because it's powered by nuclear energy, it can stay in the air without landing. Because nuclear fusion would provide us unlimited energy for thousands of years. And so I published it. You have a, a viewing area where you can organize weddings and stuff. You can also watch the video for this online. And I published it and everybody was talking about it. It was on CNN, Fox News, New York Post, everybody. And engineers on social media were like, hey, what is this monstrosity? It's never gonna work. Others were like, you know what? If you maybe tweak the aerodynamics, it might work. And I'm just like enjoying reading the conversations, <laughs> okay? Um, but that's what I love about this kind of work is that you trigger people to talk about these kinds of concepts. It was on TV, it was in all languages. If you search in any language, you will find it. And then after I posted this, it was trending for two weeks on the internet. For two weeks, it was number one topic. And then I went back to working on my full film Orbital. And again, a burnout. And then I said, you know what? Let's get back to a second concept. And this was ectolife, yeah? Where you can basically grow humans inside artificial wombs. 50 years of research that I explored to make this concept. You can watch it on um, YouTube as well. And once again, on the media, everybody's just talking about it, triggering conversations globally. Elon Musk commenting on it on Twitter, yeah? Yeah, saying that it's time for it. Japan might be in need, because he said Japan is a creative country. If it's gone, then we're gonna lose a big, a big, uh, you know, population of people who are creative. Um, and so I continue to explore these concepts, my future projects. Here are some of my future projects. Uh, you will see this soon, the head transplant machine. I was talking to an Italian surgeon who populated, uh, popularized this idea. Imagine if someone has cancer or a terminal illness or paralyzed, and you can take the head with the brain into a brain dead donor. This is still alive, but brain dead, donated body. So this will be one of the concepts that you will see soon also based on science. Another concept is the space elevator. And the space elevator takes you to space. You have a ground area and it takes you to space. It, it, it's good for many things, space tourism, asteroid mining, you can put asteroids in space and mine them there. And at the same time, you can also have unlimited solar energy. Now in space, there is no cloud to block the sun. So there's always gonna be sun in this area that is in space and it will always be sent to earth yeah again sci-fi mixed with science another one is um cryo life which is a cloning facility based on science and so if you see here i have ecto life which is the artificial womb i have neural life which is the head transplant machine and Cryo life, everything that ends with life. It's like the life universe. When you search for that, you will find a lot of innovations in that, which triggered a lot of conversations globally around these topics. I think we need to have these kinds of conversations to inspire people and to prepare them for what's coming as well, because these things will happen. And uh, these are my social media channels. If any one of you would like to join, thank you so much. Thank you, Hashem. Thank you. You gave us uh, things to think about. <laughs> I hope so. Uh, we will now uh, go to 10 minutes of Q&A. Yeah. So if you have uh, questions, uh, 
be prepared to raise your hand. Uh, I have the first question, and afterwards we will give it to the public. Um, of course, uh, science is really, really important and good for us. But do you think, uh, is there any type of downside of science? I think downside of science and anything other than science, if it falls in the wrong hand, it's always a bad thing. I mean, if terrorists kidnap a nuclear physicist and make their own nuclear bomb, that's a bad use for, of science, right? If Ectolife, which was a question that was raised a lot. Aren't you afraid that ectolife artificial worms would be used to create babies and then sell their organs and, you know, or put them in, 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 in the market or, you know, use, use them for child labor? That's also a bad use of uh, science. So everything, technology, science has two sides. It depends on who's using it and what are the applications that are generated by it. Thank you. Question here. Hello, I'm Marius. I am a cheesemaker and I own a farm. And I want to ask you, how do you see the future of the food? Food is changing every day. You yeah. see it now going on by bicycle on the streets. Uh, three years ago, it wasn't like this. Yeah. And I'm, uh, I'm wondering how, will, how would food look like in 10 yeah, years from now? That's, that's a good question. Have you, I mean, the future of food is lab made. Right, you have seen a lab about lab grown chicken, lab grown meat, lab grown milk that replicates the exact milk. So what they are trying to do is to create everything in lab conditions so that everybody is satisfied. There are people who would say, you know what, I might eat meat if it's not coming from cows. Say, so yeah, okay, we're we're growing stem cells, and stem cells are then grouped together to form flesh which tastes exactly like the real one. And even cheese, imagine in the future cheese that is not derivative of dairy product and it's made entirely in the lab. So this is the big switch that the world is moving to. There's still a lot of resistance. How many of you are going to eat lab growing meat? Please raise your hand. Okay, let me rephrase the question. That's not a lot of people. How many of you would eat lab growing meat to save the environment? and reduce climate change effect. And you see, you see? So when you advocate, when you advocate it as an environmental friendly solution, people are gonna take it. So get ready for that revolution and try to get into it. <laughs> Hi, hello. So Hi. my question for you, because you're a science communicator, is uh, how do you find the language to, tr uh, to transmit your message yeah. to the world yeah. because you have a lot of followers. So ever since I started science communication from day one, I decided that, you know, when it comes to your audience, they're all smart, but they need the right language, yeah? But you cannot create a video for every age and every uh, educational level. There are people who graduated from university, some of them just from high school, some of them are still kids. I mean, I receive emails sometimes from people saying, you know, my kid and I always watch your videos. I say, wow, fantastic. So I use the simplest language possible. Yeah, the one that everybody can understand regardless of their age, demographic, or educational background. Sometimes no language at all, actually, because you can just sell an idea visually. People just watch a video and they see the sequence of events and they understand what you're trying to convey. And that's called visual storytelling. So make the language simple, easy to understand, and pretend that you are introducing the topic from scratch, that nobody knows about what you're talking about, and connect it to something that they care about. Because that's the only way they're going to share it, like it, or engage with it. Hi. Um, Hi, just to say thank you, first of all, and it's impressive what you do. Keep it going. We do need more visionaries in this world. <laughs> Thanks. As crazy as it might be. So my question is, what do you think about the afterlife? Uh, <laughs> Opening the Pandora box here. Yeah. I actually did a video about afterlife. And, um, and so the video was highlighting a study in this study, what they did is that 
There were brain dead patients that are plugged in a life support system. They said, you know what? If we unplug the life support system, what's going to happen? Okay. They unplugged the life support system and they continued to monitor the brain. And they saw that 30 minutes after the life support system is gone, the heart has stopped and everything. There was still some brain activity. And this triggered a lot of questions. What are they seeing? What's happening? What's going on? And they also found that some genes are activated. These genes normally are activated in an embryo. And when an embryo is starting to divide, it's starting to create new organs, new life. Yeah? So this means that these genes are trying to resurrect the body from scratch. Like, hey, this, it looks like there is some death. Let's try to resurrect it. And... Um, yeah, if, if you want to search for that video, um, it's, it says your brain continues to work after death. But what do I think about it? Personally, I'm always open to new ideas, okay? I'm always exploring. It's a, always a journey of self-discovery, whether it's afterlife or anything else. I do not believe in absolutes that there is absolutely something or there is, yeah, there isn't. I prefer to keep an open mind and continue exploring because information always changes. And that's what I love about science, it's flexibility. It teaches us new things and all things become obsolete. And the only way to survive in such a world is to keep an open mind. So I say, I, I keep my mind open to afterlife as well. Uh, hi, thank you very much hi. for your presentation. And my question is a little bit connected to my colleague question, and it's about immortality. Yes. And it's, uh, this question comes from the movie Selfless. I don't know if you saw it. It's regarding a very rich man uh, and he's having uh, cancer. Yeah. And he transfers his consciousness exactly. into another younger so, one. As, I saw it. Yes, exactly. He transferred his consciousness into another body. Yes. And now uh, I have here two hypotheses. Yes. The first one is the one with the embryo that you shown us. Right. And it's regarding an uh, artificial made em embryo. Huh. And then you can transfer there your uh, yeah. conscience and True. your True. whole life. Yes. True. And another one, it's exactly the one that is happening in the movie. And there is also a question about, uh, uh, how to say it? Uh, it's about if this is fair or not. Yeah, 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 it's an ethical question. Yes, exactly, right. it's an ethical question. And do yes. you, and there also we are seeing that most of the, most richest people in the world, they are investing a lot of money yes, in yes, biotechnology yes. and yes. in the extension of life. Yeah, I'll tell you. You know, in the movie, you have two different people, different. The first one has terminal illness, cancer, and wants to live longer. He's rich, he has all the money, and he transfers his consciousness into a younger body. After that, of course, he discovers that the family of this guy is still alive, and now they are asking about him. They don't do it like that in real life, okay? They are working on something better. It's called brainless clones. You clone the exact person without the brain or without the consciousness. It's a blank, empty body. And then you transfer the consciousness. It's the same person, the same looks, the same genetic material, and they're working on it. Another concept is the brain transplant. They say, if you transplant a, a brain of an old person into a young person, the rest of the body will keep aging and the brain is already too old, so maybe it will die. But studies show that if you transfer neurons from an old person to a younger one, they rejuvenate. It's like they're aging backward. So the brain is like aging slower than the rest of the body. And so they are working on these two concepts, either brainless clones or brain transplant. So that's how it be done in the future. But is it ethical? In the, in, the, in the way it was done in the movie, I think it's unethical, unless there is consent. You know, if the guy offered that, you know, he can use my body, probably it's ethical, yeah? But he has to consult his family if he has a family. That's first. Um, but in the, in the case of brainless clones, I think it's ethical. You know, brainless clones and uh, 
brain uh, transplants, I think it's totally ethical because it's your body with your body that is involved and you have full consent of your body. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we will still uh, have questions and Hashem will stay with us uh, and uh, answer them in the networking part. But uh, as a final question, and please, uh, we'll uh, give you a moment to think about it. Uh, mm -hmm. Please uh, think about one thing and share with us one thing that uh, brought you joy this year. Something that brought me yeah. joy. And as you think, I will announce the winner of our competition, our uh, contest. So if your name starts with uh, R, R, you should get a bit uh, joyful. And if your uh, family name starts with A, A, don't you, in this case, maybe you should be a bit more uh, joyful. And if you're Ramona Agaki, you won the ticket to TEDx Zorilor, we will... Uh... So Ramona has a bit of joy this year from this. And we will get in touch after the event. And please search, share with us a thing that brought you joy this year. Yeah, well, you know, one of the things that I always do is challenge myself, yeah? When I started science communication, I, uh, you know, before I became a full-time science communicator, I was doing my PhD for three months. And then I said, you know what, I think I have higher potential in science communication. I can do more for myself, for society as well, yeah? And so I quit my PhD and I went full-time on science communication. Big challenge, but it worked. And I landed a job a freelance job, yeah? I was working for a company, a media company based in New York. I was doing it from Germany. And it was amazing, it contributed a lot to my growth, but after some time, that growth halted, it stopped. I said, I need more challenges, I need new challenges. So I quit that job as well. And I started doing everything myself which led to what I showed you today. And I moved to Berlin, where I did most of these things. At some point, you know, Berlin contributed a lot to my growth. I loved it, it was amazing. And then that growth also stopped. So I said, I wanna challenge myself in a new place and in a new environment. And that's why this year I moved from Berlin to Dubai after spending 11 years in Germany in total. And I am excited about the new opportunities. This brought a lot of joy to me because I just always look forward to the future and uh, the new opportunities that it will bring. Well, this is your first time in Cluj. Maybe you will move to Cluj in a few years, so who knows? <laughs> that is a possibility. I need good incentives. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Hashem. Thank Thanks, you. Victor. It's a Thank privilege. You. Thank I you. appreciate it. Thank you.